אמר לי רב פסטה לרב יצחק, אדם אמר אדם אמר אדם אמר אדם אמר למטה תפילת המנחה עד הערב, אמר לרב חסדא לרבי יצחק, אתה ממר דף כ"ז עמוד א' Six days of the week, Jewish boys in this Jerusalem yeshiva recite the books of the Jewish law together. The yeshiva is a religious school, and here boys from the orthodox part of the city are taught to read the Old Testament and the other books of their Jewish tradition, the Mishnah and the Talmud, in the same way as their forefathers did. Traditionally, education for Jewish children began at home. Parents had the responsibility of teaching their children about God and his dealings with his people. They taught their children God's laws and how to keep them. They also gave them instruction in wisdom from the book of Proverbs. After the Israelites returned from captivity in Babylon, a group of Bible scholars known as scribes came into being. They were members of the tribe of Levi and became known as rabbi or teachers of the law. Two of the best known rabbis were Hillel and Gamaliel, under whom Saul, a young man from Tarsus, was taught. Their teachings were eventually written down in the Mishnah, a book studied by these boys even today. It was the influence of Greek culture that first introduced schools for children in about 75 BC. Many Jews didn't like this Greek influence, so the Pharisees organized their own synagogue school, or House of the Book. Their young boys would learn the law by reciting and chanting the words together. Nazareth in the hills of Galilee is remembered today as the home of Mary and Joseph. It's a mixture of old and new.
Tourists come to see the traditional site of the angel's announcement to the Virgin Mary that she was going to have a son. Church of the Annunciation dominates the town. Following the birth of the baby Jesus in Bethlehem, Mary and her husband Joseph made their home here in Nazareth. The three years they'd spent hiding in Egypt were over and Joseph returned to his carpenter's shop. It is still possible to see an old shop like it, even today. Jesus would have grown up in the streets and alleys around the carpenter's shop, taking in all that he saw. Nazareth was a frontier town overlooking the plain of Esdraelon. The major trade routes between Egypt and the north passed across the plain. The main caravan route from the east also passed Nazareth's front door. Its position gave Nazareth a commanding view over the plain, and it had ready contact with the outside world. This gave it a certain aloofness, and its residents were looked upon with scorn by strict Jews. In fact, Nazareth isn't mentioned in Jewish writings until the time of the Romans. It was the Romans who fortified the town and brought Nazareth into the main stream of Israelite life. It's about a day's journey from Lake Galilee, where Jesus centered his three-year ministry. In this episode, we're going to look at two of the brothers of Jesus, James and Jude. They worked in a carpenter's shop, even while their elder brother Jesus also worked under Joseph's direction. The first one we're going to look at is James. There are five James mentioned in the New Testament, but this one is James, the brother of Jesus. Now, Jesus was the firstborn, and then there are mentioned in Scripture four other brothers. There was James and Joseph and Judas and Simon, and it just mentions and sisters. Now, I recognize that some Christians prefer to think of them as cousins or as members of the wider family rather than brothers or sisters in the accepted sense but this is what the scripture does say. They didn't believe that Jesus was God's son or the Messiah until after the resurrection. After the resurrection, they became believers. James, as the older of the other children, grew up in the carpenter's shop as well. And eventually he became an apostle and the leader of the church in Jerusalem. It always seemed to me to be one of those interesting points that although Jesus himself knew he was God's son and chosen to do the ministry of the great high priest to reconcile men with God, he had to stay and work in the carpenter's shop while his younger brother James went off to Jerusalem to study for the priesthood. But the significance of that is that James understood well the traditions and the loyalties and the customs and the faith of the Jewish nation. And just as the Apostle Paul had training in the Gentile philosophies, so James had training in the Jewish traditions and philosophies. He was strong in the faith, strong in the customs, strong in the traditions. It took the resurrection of Jesus to make him believe that he was the Messiah. There's a lovely old tradition about James. He went off to the priesthood seminary to learn to be a priest and he was regarded as a very holy brother. In fact, he used to pray so much. It was said that the skin of his knees became so calloused with praying that he had a nickname and the nickname was Old Camel's Knees. Incredible as it may seem that Jesus was regarded as the carpenter while James was regarded as the holy one of prayer. The other younger brother, Jude, very little is known about him except the letter that bears his name. And I'll talk about that a little later. After the resurrection, James believed 
in Jesus as the Messiah, and he became leader of the church in Jerusalem. His name suddenly comes into all the gospel accounts. Go and tell Peter, James and John, and already he's in the senior echelon of the disciples, and already, because of his training in the priesthood, he's assuming leadership among the believers. Now the disciples each went off to different parts of the world, uh, Philip and Nathaniel and Matthew, of course, John went up to Ephesus, Peter to Greece, and then over to Italy. Someone had to look after the young church back in Jerusalem, and that was James's job. He was trained for it, he was chosen for it, he was the best equipped for it. And so James stayed in Jerusalem, became the leader of the church in that part, the pastor to the young church. But it was his old traditionalism, his very priesthood training, that was going to prove to be a danger for the growing young church. In Jerusalem, James was at the centre of Jewish tradition and the growing faith of the young church. Today, the centre of Jewish life and worship is the Wailing or Western Wall. It's part of the only remaining section of the wall that supported the mound on which Herod's temple was built. And hence for Jews, it's the closest they can get to the original temple site to carry out their worship. The temple site is now occupied by the Muslim Dome of the Rock Mosque, which in its turn is built upon the rock on which Abraham was going to sacrifice his son Isaac. It's only been since 1948 that Jews have been able to return freely to this site to worship. From 70 AD, when Titus raised the temple and the Jews dispersed, Jerusalem was occupied by many peoples, including the Arabs and the Turks. But now Jewish men are able to come and celebrate their faith and traditions at the Western Wall. Jewish people have always loved their history and have been proud of their traditions. And here in the scroll room, people come to meditate on the law and to pray and to consider the Torah, the law of God. Now, even today, faithful Jews carry out all the ceremonies of the law. A Jewish man, when he gets dressed, for example, would wear next to his skin a, a garment where the tassels are drawn close to each corner, gathered together as a prayer shawl next to his skin. Then he would wear an outer garment, a prayer shawl, usually in the colours of blue and white. Frequently, Jewish people wear phylacteries on their head, little boxes made of uh, teflon, uh, a skin made out of seal skin, and also bind them on their arms with, with throngs of leather being bound seven times down their arms. And inside were the pieces of the scroll of the law. They covered their head with a kippah, and they kept the Sabbath week by week. Every Jew was responsible for eating only kosher food, and circumcision was the sign of initiation and belonging to the race, the people of God. Each Passover and at other festival times, people would come here to Jerusalem to celebrate together. The first major problem for the young church in the first century was how to deal with the freedom that Christ had brought and the traditions and laws that had been built up around Judaism. Peter, whom we looked at in the first three episodes of our series, had been asked to go to Joppa, modern-day Jaffa, to visit some Christians. While there, he raised Tabitha from the dead, but he also visited Simon, a tanner. Simon's occupation made him an outcast from Jewish life. He handled dead bodies and was therefore not allowed to worship at the temple. He was unclean. Now this worried James and the others back here in Jerusalem. But even worse than staying with Simon, Peter went on to Caesarea and stayed with a Gentile, a Roman centurion named Cornelius. Cornelius had sent for Peter and had been remarkably converted. To the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, this was all wrong. The message of Jesus was only for Jews, not Gentiles. If a non-Jew wanted to become a Christian, he first of all had to convert to Judaism, 
by being circumcised and obeying all the religious, ceremonial and dietary laws. It took 10 years for the issue to be decided, which was at a conference held in Jerusalem, led by James. It was the testimony of Peter and another apostle called Paul that convinced the young church. They pointed to their own experiences and the word of God laid down in the Old Testament. The scrolls that showed that the message of God's salvation through Jesus Christ was for all men, Jew and Gentile. James continued to pastor the young church in Jerusalem. He went on to write one small letter called the Epistle of James. Now the Epistle of James wasn't always acceptable by the church as a true letter within the canon of the New Testament. As a matter of fact, some commentators like Martin Luther referred to it as an epistle of straw because they believed it contradicted the teachings of the Apostle Paul about justification by faith alone. But James in the New Testament is not contradicting Paul. He's really giving a new emphasis upon our teaching of being a caring and a practical faith. Listen as he starts his letter and he says, if anyone thinks he's religious and yet doesn't control his own tongue, he deceives his own heart and the man's religion is worthless. But this is pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father, to visit orphans and to care for widows in distress and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. There's his emphasis about visiting, about caring, and keeping yourself unspotted from the world. That's the emphasis that James is making. But James doesn't want you to have just a caring faith. His emphasis is that it should be an active faith. That is a faith that's always in action, doing something in caring for other people. Listen how he goes on to say, what use is it if a man says he has faith but doesn't put it into action? Can that kind of a faith save him? If a brother or sister is without food or clothing and in need of daily help, and yet one of you says, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and you do not give them food and what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, if it's by itself. You see, James adds two things, caring and action, and for him, together, they make faith. Jude was the youngest of the brothers, and his concern was different again. As James was concerned for an active and a caring faith, Jude is concerned for a faith that's true, true to the witness of the other apostles. You see, he was writing at a time when we call a Gnostic heresy was about. People who had taken some of the teachings of Paul and extrapolated them to a point where any kind of behaviour was all right, so long as you had faith. Now, he wanted to say that your faith had to be a true faith. So Jude says, I feel it is necessary to write to you, appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. And then when he finished up his little letter, he said, build yourselves up in that faith, pray in the Holy Spirit, and keep yourself in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. His great emphasis was upon the fact that your faith has to be the faith delivered once for all to the other apostles. So these two brothers making an emphasis upon the faith that we should have, caring, active and true.
As we've considered the writings of James and Jude, it's worth recalling the atmosphere in which they were written. Both were probably written after the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The excavated ruins that surround the present-day walls of the city give us some idea of the total destruction by Titus nearly 2,000 years ago. Titus was the son of Vespasian, who followed Nero as Emperor of Rome in 69 AD. Vespasian had been given the task of subduing the Jewish revolt, and he allowed his son to make the final assault that destroyed Jerusalem. Ever since Rome had conquered Palestine over a hundred years earlier, in 63 BC, the Jews wanted to remove their oppressors. There were a number of Jewish sects who devoted all of their energies to guerrilla warfare against the Romans. The Zealots were one group who continually tried to stir up rebellion amongst the Jews. The revolt came to a head when an offshoot of the Zealots massacred some Roman troops at Masada in 66 AD. The leader of the temple then stopped the daily offerings that were being made to Vespasian. Vespasian ordered his troops in, and by 70 AD, Jerusalem had been destroyed. The destruction of Jerusalem and the carrying off of the sacred Ark of the Covenant by Titus is commemorated in this frieze carved on the inside of Titus's arch in the Roman Forum. The destruction of Jerusalem was the final step in removing all traces of a self-ruling Jewish nation in Palestine. Three years later, after the fall of Masada, there was nothing left of the people who had once occupied the Promised Land. Because both New Testament books by James and Jude were probably written after the destruction of Jerusalem, their letters became a great encouragement to the early Christians scattered by the Roman persecution. James reminds them of the real nature of their inner happiness. Happy is the person who remains faithful under trials, he said, because when he succeeds in passing such a test, he will receive as his reward the life which God has promised to those who loved him. James answers questions about whether it was God who brought these trials upon the believers by reassuring them of God's gift of goodness. Evil comes from the one who is the source of evil, from Satan himself. God wills for good for those who love him. Secondly, they were encouraged by the reminder that they must care for each other and help those in trouble. Their actions had to be a demonstration of their faith. You see then, it is by his actions that a person is put right with God and not by his faith alone, he wrote. Thirdly, they were reminded that they must use the resources they possessed, the wealth that they had, and their spiritual resources of fasting, prayer and healing as a witness to the world about them. God had given them resources which would enable them to stand in trials. James finishes with an encouragement to people to pray, to confess their sins to each other and to welcome back to the faith any who had left their first love. Jude's little letter warns them about false teachers who might claim to be believers and urge them to fight on for the faith which once and for all was given to God by his people. Jude reminds them of how throughout history God has always rescued his people in time of suffering and he would do the same for them also. But you, my friends, he said, keep on building yourselves up in your most sacred faith 
Pray in the power of the Holy Spirit and keep yourselves in the love of God as you wait for our Lord Jesus Christ in His mercy to give you eternal life. Under persecution, the Christians were greatly encouraged by the writings of James and Jude.